what was the most disturbing thing you saw when you were making your film? And what was the truth that you found out? You know, how did this family feel, these families feel when you came into the film? Um, the truth, I would like to not start necessarily with the most disturbing thing. I mean, I think the most, um, most encouraging thing is that these families have a lot of love and that um, there's a lot of hope and they live in this country just like us so they're exposed <laughs> to media and are excited about you know opportunity um, but the truth is it's kind of dispelling what I hope our film will do this myth of the rugged individual this notion that um, if they just pull themselves up by their bootstraps and had a, have a strong moral compass, that um, they have, it's an equal playing field, and that they have access to opportunity the way any of us sitting in this room do. And that's that's not the truth. That's a, that's a kind of myth that I hope gets broken. Well, I, I, I want to see your film, and you know, I think I think raising these questions is is incredibly. Important, and I think you know you're in a room with where we're focused on women. You know, women are obviously um, disproportionately affected by the issues around poverty, and um, so I think for that reason as well that they deserve our attention. My cousin Maria Shriver just did a big report about about women in poverty in the United States, so I encourage people to look into that too because there's some interesting. Stuff it's the ShriverReport.com, and it's it's fascinating report that Maria has done, so please do look look that up. I want to move over here to Lori. Lori. Um, I was introduced to the main subject, her name is uh, Pamela Smart, um, purely by uh, chance, and I, I didn't actually know who she was, um, but I did know the movie to die for, and, and our connection was a woman who uh, is a, a huge supporter of hers, um, who actually is one of the founding members of NOW, uh, a very sort of interesting background in, uh, as, a, as a legal scholar. And um, you probably should know what this story is about if you don't. Um, she was a media studies coordinator at a high school in New Hampshire. Uh, in less than a year that she was married, her husband, who uh, had an affair, uh, she ended up having an affair with um, a 16-year-old student. He and his three friends uh, murdered her husband. She says she was breaking up the relationship, uh, and he did it out of jealousy. They uh, did a plea bargain and said she masterminded the killing. Anyway, what was fascinating to me is that there were all these really interesting artists doing, creating this image of a woman that um, I felt like I really needed to find out what was real, what was not real, and how, how media creates these narratives or artists, us, all of us. She was really the first reality show. Pamela Smart, that trial was really the first time the country tuned in and every day they wanted to watch the Pamela Smart story. And when she appeared in those bathing suits, we all said, well look, he's taking pictures of her in the bathing suit. He's 16 years old. Oh my God, she's horrible. And then you find out later in your film that those pictures were taken by her girlfriends when she was young. It was just a bunch of girls in the room taking pictures of each other, and they were never taken by this 16-year-old boy. And basically our film is about uh, being a black face in an all-white place, and these four college students who are struggling with identity, and it sort of crystallizes when the college that they're in has a race-themed party, a black face party. So that's sort of the premise. So we found that uh, the director was Justin Simeon, who is amazing, I love him, um, started this uh, by a Twitter feed. So by testing out the voices of the voice of our lead character, Sam, in regard to things that a lot of people of color, this is our truth. We don't really get a lot of um, a platform to say it, but because it's uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, these are tools that the lay person can use that we can't get blocked from. Uh, that's my opinion. And that, and that truth of dear white people, uh, which deals with race, identity, and uh, in sort of a comedic way, came about. Yes, that's and what I was asking. Yeah. Do, do you think that your film deals with racism, or do you think your film is really just a story about struggling for identity? You can call it a struggle of um, identity, but our identity 
is very wrapped up in being a person of color. We had a female prime minister go to fire that got us into a really, really big war. Um, you know, the Yom Kippur War, and we're still paying a big price for this war. So you think there's gender equality there in terms of male, female? It really doesn't matter. In, in Israel, or even in well, that we would probably end up in the same situation. <laughs> I, I guess it depends. It is. I mean, definitely there's no gender equality in politics, but uh, but I think that. Um, I'm hoping that we have some to do more. I think there is one that we are, maybe some of us are hoping. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm actually um, doing a documentary about women in politics right now as well. It's part of the uh, Maker series for PBS, which was about the women's movement. It's now expanding into a six part series. So I'm doing two segments one on women in Hollywood and one on women in politics. And one of the things that we found that is interesting is that women have do govern us slightly differently than men, or at least the women who are in politics, and you know, I don't want to make huge generalizations, but you know, one of the stories we're focusing is on the government shutdown and how you know the, with a, such a divisive Congress, the Congress wasn't speaking on the left and the right, they weren't speaking to each other. But the women on both sides of the aisle were talking with each other and talking to each other, and they are given the credit for for getting the government up and running again.